What necessity truly is in self-consciousness is for this new form of self-consciousness in which it knows its own self to be the principle of necessity. It knows that it has the universal of law immediately within itself and because the law is immediately present in the being for self of consciousness, it is called the law of the heart. This form takes itself to be qua individuality, essence, like the previous form. But the new form is richer because its being for self has for it the character of necessity or universality. With paragraph 367, we've now reached another important transition point in the phenomenology. We're moving into this, this uh, section called the law of the heart and the frenzy of self-conceit. The Wahnsinn could also mean something like insanity, the insanity of, of self-conceit. The stress here in these, these first paragraphs is going to be on the law of the heart and, and what this means. Before I talk about that, and before we go into that, that particular uh, paragraph, let's think for a moment about where this fits into the phenomenology and what we've traversed. So we just finished up with the very short section, pleasure and necessity. And you see here, you know, pleasure on one side, necessity on the other. That is what has been left behind. But remember that when we're leaving something behind, we're never truly leaving it behind in the Hegelian dialectic. We are, as we move to another shape, a gestalt of consciousness, aufhebung, that is, uh, however you want to translate, sublation, transcendence, takes place. And what that does is that brings along somewhat of what was surpassed. So there's an integrative function. There's a moving on, having learned certain lessons. And remember, too, that some uh, actual self-consciousnesses within history or the ones who are still, you know, sort of replicating these dynamics in the present may, in fact, be uh, stuck in, in a previous stage of the dialectic and, and never really get out of it. They never have the realization. So pleasure and necessity, the law of the heart, and then the section that's going to follow it, virtue and the way of the world, are all part of this shorter middle section of the reason section, the actualization of self-consciousness, or if we want the longer uh, title, the actualization of rational self-consciousness, self-consciousness that is reason through its own activity. Let's remind ourselves as well that self-consciousness, once it became liberated from what Hegel was calling ethical substance, once it, it, liberated is perhaps too strong of a term, once it had broken itself free of the sway of laws and mores and customs and you know, everybody having their, their sort of determinate place within the organic community, and it became an individual in a stronger sense, now it began looking for its own happiness, its own gluck, right? And the question is, well, what, what does happiness actually consist in? Now, what's particularly interesting about this section, as opposed to previous treatments of happiness, is that Hegel is, is treating this in a distinctively modern way. He really is engaging in a phenomenology, he is looking at the phenomena of modern uh, ethical life. And, and by ethical life, we mean this, this seeking out of what is meaningful, what is, what is going to provide us with happiness. Another way of saying it is what is essential to the human being qua human being. And not everybody is able to do this. Of course, this is, this is something that you might say is, in, in large respect, the privilege, the shape that we're looking at here, the privilege of either an elite few who have the resources to be able to have these sorts of mindsets or those who arrive at the point where they have nothing to lose. Because what we're talking about here, according to Hegel and, and many of his commentators, is a distinctively modern way of understanding oneself as an individual through practical life. This notion of the law 
of the heart within oneself. It's not the voice of God. It's not the you know voice of uh, society or the logos or however you want to put it. It is the human heart and its its sentimentality revealing new principles to us about how we ought to behave. So who does Hegel have in mind in thinking about this sort of stuff? Well, among philosophers, I think that we could say, for example, Rousseau. Although there were many other philosophers along this this line as well. Rousseau is just somebody who we still read today. Um, In um, drama, in in literature, there's other people as well who are going to uh, assume an important role in this. And we, we generally class them under this rubric of romanticism. Now, when we talk about being romantic today, we have this um, rather superficial notion of what it means to be romantic. As a matter of fact, we think of it primarily, when we say romantic, we think erotic, right? Except sort of a sublimated eroticism. But what they had in mind was a way of getting towards something that was deeper, something we would discover within our own hearts, our emotions, our passions. And it was supposed to, as we'll see as we get to later paragraphs, it was supposed to be leading us to a higher state of being, a better way of of, uh, developing self-consciousness, something that would, in fact, hopefully uh, rework the, the, you know, uh, alienated society and bring about some sort of reconciliation, although a sentimental rather than a strictly rational reconciliation. So all of that is very important to keep in mind as we move into this, this section. So Hegel talks about this as being a, a new shape of consciousness. And he says, what necessity truly is in self-consciousness It is for this new form, this new gestalt of self-consciousness, in which it knows its own self to be the principle of necessity. So what we had going on in the past dialectic was the the individuated person is seeking, taking, enjoying pleasure. But we saw that that actually led away from pleasure as being any sort of realization And it led ultimately to something that was unsatisfying, which is necessity or fate. And Hegel said this is uh, understood as a great unknown, as as a working that actually crushes the individual. And this is a universal. Now, these end up sort of being taken out of the picture and being brought under the rubric of self-consciousness. And the necessity is now placed within self-consciousness. Now, why? Well, from a phenomenological perspective, remember that whenever there's some sort of alienation that's happening, think back to the, uh, the unhappy consciousness as, as a prime example. This is some, something is projected out there as the universe, and I'm the lowly individual in relation to it. I'm just a particular. I'm not worthy. That's where the real action, the essentiality is happening. Well, I'm the one who's thinking that. Uh, that exists as such for me because I am consciousness. So a similar reincorporation happens at the beginning of this. And so Hegel says, it knows that it has the universal, not just the universal in terms of essence or what it is to be a human, but the universal of law, of gazettes. And how does this have it? It has it immediately within itself. Because, he says, the law is immediately present in the being for self of self-consciousness. What does it mean to be self-conscious? It means to be not only being in itself, but to be being for oneself, to be aware of oneself, including the distance that this produces from oneself, the fact that one cannot be reduced to merely one's characteristics or, or a story about oneself or uh, any sort of objective thing like that, because there's a dynamism there, right? There's a reflexivity. So in this stage, it's not aware of this in terms of a concept. It's in terms of the heart, 
And the heart is, you know, we talk about the heart in many different ways. Um, you know, metaphorically, it's sort of the locus of, of love and, and love is very important. Love is a, from a Hegelian perspective, a passion, a sentiment, a feeling, ein Gefühl, right? And so much of what is going to happen with this is the individuality finds within itself new principles, even a, a law, but it's going to be expressed in terms of something that is very individuated, which is feeling. Not something conceptual that can include everybody else. That's going to be the big problem with this. But at first, this seems quite promising. I look within myself and I find a law. How do I know that law is there? I feel it. It convinces me. I, I know, for example, I see suffering humanity and my heart responds and I know what the right thing to do is. And I'm no longer so alienated as I was encountering just blind necessity telling me, hey, you know, your pleasure uh, is happening within the wheels of this necessity that's going to break your pleasure into nothing. Right? I feel like I matter more, like my existence, like I, my life, my action, my feelings, my fine thoughts matter more. As a matter of fact, they are expressive of a law that is bringing together what is finest in humanity. I'm no longer just grubbing after tawdry pleasures. I'm about what, what life is really for. So he says, this form takes itself to be qua individuality, essence, like the previous form. But the new form, there's something going on here. It is, as he says, richer because its being for self has the character of necessity or universality that's been taken back into it. Necessity, universality now fall within the province of the individual. This looks very, very promising indeed. The law, therefore, which is immediately self-consciousness's own law or a heart which, however, he has within it a law is the end which self-consciousness proceeds to realize. We have to see whether its realization corresponds to this notion and whether in that realization it will find that this, its law, is its essential nature. This short paragraph, number 368, is not developing very much, but it is setting our, our problem into view that we're going to be grappling with in, in the paragraphs yet to come. So what we've got here are a number of different terms. We've got self-consciousness and the heart, which are really the same thing, but self-consciousness is understanding itself as the heart or understanding the heart as what is most essential in it. And then we have the law, the gazettes, right, of the heart, but it's a law in general. And there's some sort of end, a zvek, a goal, a purpose. And Hegel will also talk in terms of realization and the contrast between the realization and this notion. Now, we should understand, as we always do, notion can mean more than one thing. Here, we take it as sort of the notion in the impoverished sense, a, a mere idea, this idea of the law, something that's being you know, experienced and, and lived out and practiced, and then the notion in the sense of that which is bringing all these things together and is not just the thing that's being compared, but the comparison or the action of comparison to this end. So there's a lot actually going on in here. But like I said, this is not actually resolving anything. This is setting the problem. So he says, the law, which is immediately self-consciousness's own law, or a heart, which, however, has within it a law. So the law belongs to self-consciousness or the heart. It's coming out of them in some sense. Uh, the, the question where it actually comes from isn't resolved at this point. But he says, it, the law is the end, the zvek, the goal. And this can be understood in terms of sort of an ideal that's, that's attempted to be put into to practice or measured up to, right? But it can also be understood in terms of its verwirklichung, its realization, its being made actual. How does it pan out when you follow out the uh, urgings of your heart 
does it turn out the way that it should? That provides us with the real measure, right? So you feel a sense of sympathy with people. You act on that. Uh, does it actually produce good effects for them and for yourself? Or does it make things worse in the, in the process? That is the end. That's the fear that shows it, you know, what, what, what's actually going on. So he says, we have to see whether it's realization corresponds to this notion and whether in that realization it will find that this, its law is its essential nature. So it's, it's not yet up, you know, uh, we could say it, 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 at this point, it's actually up for debate whether it's going to pan out or not. It hasn't yet produced what ideally it looks like or feels like or sounds like it ought to be producing. So we don't know at this point whether the law of the heart is just a kind of um, mistake or uh, a trap or a dialectical uh, divergence or whether we're directing ourselves towards some sort of higher end, some sort of greater purpose, some sort of better, more essential way of being that we have to find out by actually trying to actualize it, to realize it. This heart is confronted by a real world, for in the heart the law is, in the first place, only for its own self. It is not yet realized, and is therefore at the same time something other than what the notion is. This other is thereby characterized as a reality which is the opposite of what is to be realized, and consequently is the contradiction of the law and the individuality. This reality is therefore, on the one hand, a law by which the particular individuality is oppressed, a violent ordering of the world which contradicts the law of the heart, and on the other hand, a humanity suffering under that ordering, a humanity that does not follow the law of the heart, but is subjected to an alien necessity. It is evident that this real world which appears over against the present form of consciousness is nothing else but the foregoing discordant relationship of individuality and its truth the relationship of a cruel necessity by which the former is oppressed. For us, the preceding movement appears to stand over against the new form, because the latter in itself has resulted from it, and the moment from which it has come is therefore necessary for it. But to the new form, that moment appears as something already given, since it is not conscious of its origin, and it holds that its essential nature is rather to be for its own self or the negative element relatively to this positive in itself. Here now in paragraph 369, we arrive at a first, we might call it schematization of the law of the heart and the way in which it works. It has a correlative term which is going to be the world or the other to it. And at times that's going to be understood as, as it's called here, sort of an alien necessity and external reality. But, but this is also a reality of other people, of other individuals, of other self-consciousnesses. And that's going to raise some really interesting problems in the course of this study because what we've got going on at first is a person who says, I, I have a law within my heart that I can follow, that I need to realize. Now, where can it be realized? Well, it can be realized in terms of oneself with a kind of circularity that the for itself gives. But as we've seen over and over and over again throughout the phenomenology, it's not a realization unless it happens outside of the sphere of your own self-consciousness. There is no you know, possibility of, you might say, a narcissistic satisfaction in Hegel. Instead, it has to be engaging with what we're translating here, according to Miller, as the real world, or the German for it is Wirklichkeit, actuality, something that is different than, that is other than the self-conscious individual. So this law of the heart calls out to be realized out there in the social world that includes other human beings. 
And here's where we're going to start running into some issues. The other thing that I want to point out is really coming towards the, the end of this, this paragraph. Um, Hegel is pointing out a, a, a sort of forgetting a lack of realizing its own origins that's involved in any sort of similar romanticism or sentimentality uh, that involves this law of the heart. So he says, um, the, uh, for us, the preceding movement appears to stand over against the new form because the latter in itself has resulted from it and the moment from which it has come is therefore necessary for it. That's what we can say as the phenomenologist who's studying this, right? And if we're thinking about particular individuals, we might talk about a person shifting out of this, this original phase of their life where they're just sort of seeking pleasure in an individualistic way and they run into sort of alien necessity and now they, they arrive at this law of the heart, uh, but then they forget about that, the past. They, they don't acknowledge it. So he says, um, to the new form, that moment appears as something already given. The law of the heart within oneself in opposition to the world is something that's just there. I just happen to have found it. I, maybe I didn't know it before, but now that I'm conscious of it, it's always been there. You know, My uh, yearning to help humanity by going off and doing mission work of this sort, or my yearning to right all the wrongs on the internet by the way I comment on things, showing what a swell guy I am. You know, so enlightened, so uh, right thinking, so whatever it happens to be, whatever values we're, we're standing for. So he says, uh, it, it appears as something already given since it is not conscious of its own origin and it holds that its essential nature is rather to be for its own self or the negative element relatively to the positive in itself. The positive in itself is the world that it's confronting. And to skip ahead a little bit, what's it going to say about the world? The world is screwed up. It's my job to make it better, to fix it, to bring something good into it, to, whether it's you know, planting flowers somewhere or helping the, the uh, impoverished or you know, uh, counseling somebody who's, who's feeling blue or whatever, whatever we're going to talk about. You know, making wonderful music that, that uplifts people. All of this could be expressions of the law of the heart as Hegel's talking about it. So let, let's go now to what he says at the beginning. He says, the heart is confronted by a real world. For in the heart, the law is in the first place only for its own self it is not yet realized, it has not reached that zvek, that end that we talked about in the previous paragraph, and therefore, at the same time, something other than what the notion is. Its notion hasn't been realized. So he says this other, what is the other? Is thereby characterized as a reality, which is the opposite of what is to be realized. So where do you realize the law of the heart? In the external reality. And why do you realize it there? Because the external reality is screwed up. It's not the way it should be. The law of the heart is supposed to provide us with a new way of being, a new ordering. So he, he says um, uh, what we've got here is a contradiction of the law and the individuality. That's what this, this world is. It contradicts the law of the heart within. It says this is the way things are ordered. Hegel uses this term ordnung there uh, a little bit later. And so we've got the, the, the way the world is structured, the way the world is set up, which is cruel, which is unfair, which does not satisfy not only our, our you know, sort of primitive desires for pleasure, but also our, our uh, you know, sentiment for something better, for self-respect, for people being treated fairly, for people getting their just desserts. If you're a villain, you should be treated like a villain. If you're a hero, like a hero. If you're a victim, we should defend you, you know, go on and on and on. We should heal the wounded and so forth. So he says, we have a contradiction there. This reality, he says, is therefore on the one hand, a law by which the particular individuality is oppressed. So there's a law in the heart, 
which at this point is not yet effective. And then there's a law of the world, which he, he at this point expresses it as an order, an ordnung. And this ordering, uh, you know, a violent, gewaltige ordering of the world, it contradicts the law of the heart. And then he says, on the other hand, what we have is a humanity suffering under this particular ordering. So we have the individual and then we have humanity sort of writ large. And what we don't actually see is, of course, that humanity is in that real world. But the sentimentalist, you know, sees the, the you know, the, the victims as, as something different than the oppressive power structure or, you know, however we want to talk about it. He, later, he's going to talk about, you know, the priests and the, the tyrants and all that. And that's coming straight from Rousseau, basically. So he goes on and he says, uh, humanity that does not follow the law of the heart, but is subjected to an alien necessity. So we've got three terms here now. We've got the individual who is following the law of the heart. That's where self-consciousness is developing. We have the, you know, the bastards who are pushing everybody down and following the way in which they think the world has to go. And it's just terrible, you know, powers and principalities. And there's no good reason for what they're doing, but there is an ordering. And then there's a humanity that suffers under this order because they don't realize what the law of the heart says about them. So perhaps, you know, they, they all, you know, buy into the profit motive and they're all trying to screw each other over, making each other miserable in the process. And none of them are getting ahead like those fat cats on the top of the pyramid here. And we can go on and on with all sorts of other examples of this. So he goes on and he says, um, it's evident this real world, which appears over against the present form of consciousness is nothing else, but the foregoing discordant relationship of individuality and truth, the relationship of a cruel necessity by which the former is oppressed. What is he talking about there? We already went through something like this in the pleasure and necessity dialectic, but the person who is now captivated by the law of the heart forgets about that, as we said earlier in this. And we have a new beginning in terms of this law of the heart and what it can possibly be applied to. So now we need to see where we're going to go from here and how this opposition is going to play itself out.